podcast, An Intelligent Look at Terrorism. I'm your host, Phil Gursky, President and CEO of Borealis Threat and Risk Consulting in Ottawa, Canada. When you come across a story in the media about a terrorist attack or a serious act of violence, where do you go next? Do you leap to the conclusion that the perpetrator must be somebody who's got, is really messed up, whether it's messed up in their personal circumstances or is messed up actually in terms of psychological or some kind of mental illness. Seems to me that a lot of people jump to that immediate conclusion that anybody who engages in heinous acts of violence can't be normal, whatever normal is supposed to mean. I've always pushed back against that based on my experience with this, with the Canadian Security Intelligence Service and some of the work that I've done. But I thought I'd bring in today an old friend of mine who can probably answer these questions much better than I can. So I'm pleased to welcome to the podcast Peter Collins, who I've known for decades. He's a forensic psychiatrist with the Ontario Provincial Police, or the OPP, where he has been there since 1995, which is a hell of a long time. Before that, he was with the RCMP. And uh, he's also, since 1992, even longer, he's been a member of the Crisis Hostage Negotiation Team with the Toronto Police Service Emergency Task Force. I've known Peter for decades. And Peter, thank you for joining me on the podcast. My pleasure. Let's get right into it, Peter. You are a psychiatrist by profession. Uh, I've seen lots of TV programs where their psychiatrists are brought in. Are you one of those guys that, you know, the egghead in the corner that that kind of solves the problem for the police? Or can you describe me your relationship with police forces over all these decades? Sure. I, I'm an operational forensic psychiatrist. As far as I know, I'm the only one in Canada. Congratulations. Who works? Well, I don't know. I'm trying to attract others so I can eventually retire. I started my career actually as a criminologist and then went to medical school and couldn't decide between forensic pathology or the autopsy end of uh, in that area, uh, medical examination end of uh, things, or the behavioral aspect of it. And certainly when I was a criminologist, uh, I worked closely with police. And after getting my medical degree and my internship, completing my internship, I did a year of anatomical pathology, which is a stepping stone to forensic pathology, and decided, you know what, I do like the behavioral side of the house. Uh, Throughout medical school, I did attend crime scenes as a member of the forensic pathology team as a medical student, but I still got uh, consulted when I did go into psychiatry by uh, police and police agencies that knew me from before I went to med school. And when I qualified in 1989, I decided to, well, I was asked to start lecturing at the Toronto Police uh, College, Seal Bit College. And then in 1990, based on an unsolved homicide from Ottawa, I was consulted by the homicide detectives there. And um, at the same time, I didn't realize this, they were also consulting uh, an individual, an inspector from the RCMP, who had just completed the training program for non-FBI profilers at Quantico, a nine-month program. And uh, we eventually uh, found out about each other through the Ottawa police because we were being consulted on the same case. And... um, That's when I was invited to be the second person in what was then known as the violent crime uh, analysis section. To go back to your original question, I don't know if I'm the egghead in the corner. I'm not a profiler, (laughs) but I end up involved in in consulting in various aspects of, of, of violent crime generally, but also threat assessments, dealing with problems with informants and agents and witness protection issues, uh, a lot of interview strategies and undercover strategies. So each and every day is, is, is different. In 2001, I was asked to come on board with the newly formed, it may have been 2002, Integrated National Security Enforcement Team. The insets, yeah, that were a body that was created by the RCMP after 9-11. Right. And um, initially, I was um, attached to the source development recruitment with INSET, but uh, got involved more in 
other aspects, uh, the investigative aspects and interview strategies when it came to some of these individuals who uh, came to light because of their extremist uh, views. So um, unlike a lot of colleagues and unlike what one sees in, in the, the media, you're not going to see me commenting on cases on TV. You have the luxury of doing that, and that's because you weren't allowed to talk to anyone for 30 years. Now you, now <laughs> and you I just felt up. so lonely. I had to talk <laughs> yes, to somebody. Yes, I know. <laughs> but what you, what you have to say is always uh, uh, refreshing because there are too many people who go on TV and chat, and they don't know the case. Mm-hmm. And it's frustrating. It's so so and uh, I've seen this uh, time and time again. I saw it with a very high-profile homicide case that my agency was uh, the sole agency, uh, lead agency on it, and it got worldwide attention. And after the arrest and prior to the trial, but after the arrest, People were on TV, psychiatrists, psychologists, criminologists, profilers, people who claimed to be profilers who weren't. Uh, Anyone can claim to be a profiler. And every single person got it wrong in terms of what this person was. And it gets back to your original sort of... uh, question about TV or a reference to TV because it's not like what's on TV and human behavior is much more complex. And in police investigations, there's always going to be key fact or hold back evidence that only the police know. And the person on TV who's being interviewed, they're not going to have, uh, they're not mm-hmm. going to be privy to it. And my kids growing up knew that, um, you know, I, They would say, well, I would tell them if the person knew what he was talking about, he wouldn't be talking to the media. (laughs) Exactly. Because you have some really good, really good points, Peter. This is this could be a whole other podcast about whom Canadians should uh, look to when it comes to insight and understanding of the types of things that you and I have have worked on. That that's that's a whole other kettle of fish. So if I could summarize, you know, your sort of your career, you, you had a very difficult sort of a, 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 a Hobson's or Sophie's choice, I'm not sure which, ter- which term to use, between looking at dead bodies and live ones in terms of behavior, and you opted to look for the behavioral side. You found that to be a little more compelling, although I can see why both would be equally interesting at the time. Oh, there's still, I mean, uh, I still will go to the postmortems for cases that I've been consulted on, you know, with the police. Uh, but most of the time, uh, the blood is already dry, mm-hmm. and I rely on the uh, postmortem photographs, which uh, come with any package of a crime that myself and the team that I work for, because I don't do this individually. I work with a right. team of, of course. police officers. Of course. Um, but as both are fascinating. I think I was better, um, probably better at uh, doing the behavioral end of it. Uh, but I'm no stranger to the uh, post-mortem suite mm-hmm. and uh, certainly uh, will uh, get insight and understanding if uh, I, I do go to the, the post-mortems. It certainly sounds that your your career and the twists and turns that it's taken, you and I have been in this business for about the same period of time. Right. It is fascinating that I always tell people that I had a job where I couldn't wait to get to work every morning because every day was different. There was always something on the agenda that needed my attention. It was constantly changing. It wasn't the same old, same old. And it sounds very much like you've, you've had an equally rewarding and fascinating, demanding career over the 30 odd years that you've been in that business. Well, when you and I first met, and I can't recall whether it was um, at CSC. I think it was the at the East Memorial Block when CSIS was no didn't have their headquarters yet mm-hmm. across from Parliament is when I first met you. And um, I had mentioned, and you agreed that you and I have free tickets to the best show on earth. 
<laughs> exactly, exactly. I want to pick up on what I what I started with, Peter, and this is this notion that for most Canadians, Americans, most, if I can use the term lay people, when they read an account of a particularly heinous crime or a particularly violent crime, I would bet dollars to donuts that almost everybody thinks, oh, that guy must be nuts. Oh, he must be mentally ill. Oh, he must not be playing with a full deck. In your experience, and we're talking here just about violent crime in general. I don't want to, I don't want to narrow it to terrorism just yet, but violent crime in general. Do you think that most people default to that position? And in your experience with the cases that you've worked on, I'm not going to ask you for percentages, but just more of a, a general sense. Do you think that most people are correct when they say that a person who is capable of committing a heinous act of violence must by definition not be a normal, mentally sound person? That seems to be the, the fallback. And um, I get upset uh, again, when I hear people talk about an individual or even the media, and they stigmatize individuals who have uh, mental illness, but people who have serious uh, emotional disturbances uh, are not more violent than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And often it's not the diagnosis of the mental illness because the, the diagnosis of mental illness is weakly associated with violence. It really comes down to a subgroup of specific symptoms. But if you look at the studies that are done and some of them are longitudinal studies, one was a 13 year period where they looked at crime rates among people who had diagnosable serious mental illness in Sweden and they did it over a 13 year period. and what they found was that there were approximately 45 violent crimes committed per 1,000 inhabitants, if one did a population base. And of these, uh, only 2.4 were attributable to people who had a severe mental illness. 2.4? 2.4. So um, the risk factors were that of about 5%. So patients with severe mental illness commit one in 20 violent acts or known violent acts. And there can be times when individuals have paranoid beliefs, which puts them more at risk, but the risk of violence is still better predicted by being a young male mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. by a diagnosis of schizophrenia irrespective of your actual mental state. And I, we know the statistics, right? Young males commit by far disproportionately the vast majority of crimes. Old farts like you and me are, you know, mental states notwithstanding are much less uh, susceptible or uh, in a position to commit these violent acts. Right. And it's um, the younger the male, the more apt they're going to be violent. And, um, it's also the combination of, of alcohol as well. So if you are a, I'm, I'm gonna try and dig up the stats, but if you have a, a, a substance abuse in a serious mental illness, that will up the percent chance that you'll be violent. If you are, have just have the diagnosis of a major mental illness, it's still people who have the sole diagnosis of a substance abuse that are more uh, more uh, apt to be violent than those who have that combination. So it's um, it also comes down to a number of other things as well. The symptoms of you know a delusion. A delusion is sort of a fixed false idea that's inconsistent with the person's culture or subculture. Many illnesses, there are delusions, but there is a slightly higher percentage of violence if there's a delusion of persecution or paranoia mm, okay. or a delusion of infidelity. Oh, okay. Which would account for some of the instances where, again, largely males will seriously injure or kill their wives slash girlfriends if there's a feeling that they haven't been faithful to them. Well, that yes, but the vast majority of those people who commit domestic violence are not mentally ill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They may feel that uh, their spouse, for whatever reason, is not um, faithful. 
but these are the people who actually have the delusional belief, even though there may not be any evidence that they, they go out. So again, that's a small percentage. People who have delusions of passivity, that they feel that they're being controlled by outside forces, have a slightly higher percent. You know, when these symptoms are uh, present, they may double the risk of violence, but still most people with such symptoms will not be violent at all. So it's the person who's personality disordered for the most part. So about 70% of our federal penitentiary population consists of people who are what are termed antisocial personality disorders or have antisocial personality traits, and that's heavily loaded with criminality. Are they mentally ill? No. no have right. we inherited them in psychiatry? Yes, yes. but their mm -hmm. character disorders, their their personality disorders. And there's a there's a whole I mean, we could go down this this rabbit hole of having local law enforcement being your primary, uh, I don't know, forces that deal with people on the streets who have issues. And we you know the whole defund the police movement is in part to get more more money into the uh, the mental health and and the primary care industries. You you mentioned that the people who think they're being controlled. I remember my time at CSIS and CSE. We would have people show up at the front door and, and ask us to turn off the brain waves and. You know, they'd be wearing colanders on their head kind of thing. I want to push you a little bit, Peter, and ask you to speculate on why it is that most people when asked to describe or typify a person who's committed an act of violence. They will, they will retort the person must be mentally ill. Is that because most people cannot fathom that a normal, again, I use the term normal rather um, liberally here in this podcast, but a person with a normal psychiatric disposition is incapable of carrying out an act of violence? Is that part of the problem? I think that's part of the problem as well. But anything horrendous can't really be readily explained initially in the public eye. People will default to, well, they had to be crazy mm -hmm. or they had to be insane. Insa sanity being a legal term, only 1%, less than 1% of um, individuals who come into conflict with the law meet the criteria for section 16 under the criminal code in other words they're not criminally responsible by reason mm -hmm. of insanity Correct. So, mm -hmm. and even individuals who do have diagnosed uh, emotional disturbances many of them are more at risk of harm to themselves than they are to to other people it does occur i've testified a number of, of, of trials but a good example of, of a case i was uh, heavily involved with many years ago was uh, over two years of my life uh, committed to, to working on it prior to the rest and afterwards was the Paul Bernardo Carla Homoka case. And people would insist that this guy had to be mentally ill. And of course, I couldn't talk. Mm -hmm. They would also say that uh, Carla was the evil one. Mm -hmm. I've heard that because as well. Because if, the, yeah, if, if people can't explain something, again, they're going to come up with some type of uh, externalize the blame and that blame is going to be, well, you know, they had to be crazy. Mm -hmm. Another um, example of that would be, um, I remember, I don't talk to the media, but I had to because when I found out what other people were saying, when Anders Breivik. In our region, right. It was actually uh, in, in, uh, nine years ago yesterday when he carried his attack. Exactly. I read that on your uh, blog. Well, thank you. And there's an excellent book um, that was written about it uh, by uh, a lay person um, uh, translated into English called, I believe it was One of Us. I have, I have that, yeah. I, I have that book. And, and I thought it was a good sort of um, overview of, of the whole of that person. But colleagues of mine... Uh, in the States and in Canada, we're saying, well, this guy's mentally ill. This is after the arrest. And I said, well, you know, likely not mm -hmm. because of the planning and deliberation uh, that went into it. And ultimately, it was pl it was planned over months and months. And this guy didn't wake up one morning and decide to plant a bomb outside the Norwegian parliament and then go to an island and slaughter almost 70 young people. He had Put this into place uh, meticulously over a long period of time right and and in a recent article by um a, a, a colleague of ours 
uh, down in, in the States, Reed Malloy, he applied um, the TRAP-18, which you know we, we use mm-hmm. in, in policing as a risk assessment tool, uh, applied it retrospectively to uh, Breivik, and certainly he fulfilled the criteria for some of the proximal and distal signs mm-hmm. of, of the TRAP-18. Glad you've raised Breivik, Peter, and this this takes us into our next question, which I hinted at before. Anders Breivik is clearly a terrorist. He carried out his his act for a some kind of ideology. I actually have his fifteen hundred page manifesto in three volumes on my bookshelf. I haven't waded through it all yet because it is a bit is a bit of a stream of consciousness. But so when it comes to terrorism, I find people react in equal ways to the due to, to just general violent crime. They think that terrorists must be mentally unwell. No one would choose terrorism. The ergo, all terrorists must have mental illness problems. And that has all kinds of implications for the justice system, which you are, 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 are well aware of. You and I worked together over the years. Based on the terrorism cases or instances with which you have some knowledge, would, do you think that what applies to violence in general when it comes to the nexus between mental illness and violence also applies to terrorism? We still don't have a lot of data when it comes to uh, terrorism. And there have been some good studies by, by colleagues of ours. And it depends on what type of terrorist or extremist we're, we're talking about. Paul Gill and Emily Curtin in Britain have looked at this problem uh, over a number of years. And there's probably more emotional disturbance among lone actors as opposed to other types of, um, you know, extremists. So what do I mean by lone actors? I don't like the term lone wolf. Neither do I. But a lot of these people will go out and they have um, real issues when it comes to dealing with other people in society. And they will end up having a grievance. They'll develop an ideology. That ideology may involve trying to right a wrong, but it doesn't mean that they have a, a, a mental illness. Many of them are, are again, um, have character problems. But the general rule of thumb is, is that of the lone actors, maybe about 30 to 35 percent have had a, a mental health history. Now, some of that may be addictions. Mm-hmm. Some of that may be depression. But the vast majority of people who have depression are more at risk to themselves. So the, it's not so far, as I mentioned, right? It's not just that, but generally, if you if you go down sort of like the or, or look at the hierarchy of the different types of extremists, there's going to be more emotional disturbance among the lone actors, and they will be committed to the pathway towards violence, the one where they're you know everyone has a grievance. You know people have grievances, people have ideology. You know in university when you were an undergrad, people had. I mean I was as a high school student and as a university student. I uh, you know I was against the war in Vietnam. I belonged to the high school students uh, against the war in Vietnam. Ironically, I ended up in uniform in Afghanistan about <laughs> you know thirty years later as a member of the Canadian forces. But I wasn't planning to, I did attend protests, but I didn't then go further and do research and planning and preparation or implement an attack. You were going to blow shit up, in other words. Nah, I I wasn't going to. But other people will take that ideation and turn it into a grievance and then go on to that pathway of violence. Some of these folks will have they become fixated and they have a pathological preoccupation with a person or a cause. Doesn't mean that they're mentally ill, but Mm -hmm. what happens because of this fixation is sometimes they do have 
a deterioration in their social and occupational life because it becomes their goal, it becomes their their career. There's some who who identify to be like a pseudo commando and have a warrior mentality. I'm glad you mentioned that because the only case to the best of my knowledge in Canada in let's say the post 9-11 period where there was a terrorist attack it took place in Toronto in 2016 in April I believe where a man called Ayanla Hassan Ali went into an armed force recruiting center in Markham I believe with a knife he ended up wounding two soldiers he was eventually found not criminally responsible for his attack, which I assume, is that your Section 16 you're referring to earlier? Yes. Now, I was not involved in, in that case. I know people who were. It was the recruiting center on Young Street in North York. Right. And he was uh, found not criminally responsible. And I have dealt with people who have murdered individuals, and then either after the fact or it was part of their paranoid beliefs beforehand, they incorporate a, um, for lack of a better word, jihadist interpretation to their actions. So that can occur, but it's, it's, it's rare. There was also that woman, again, I wasn't involved in that case, who killed someone in the, uh, in the, the underground in Toronto in a store. Mm-hmm. And I don't know enough details about the case, but there was an element of paranoia there, apparently, that had to do with some religiosity. But Mm -hmm. religious delusions are not uncommon. Exactly. Exactly. So you can sometimes get a person who will marry up the, the religious delusions with what's happening out in society. And delusions kind of follow with what's going on in the present time. I mean... In the 1800s, people did not have delusions about aliens or UFOs, right? Because we didn't know the existence of either. Exactly. Uh, People at the turn of the last century didn't think that radios were talking about them or, you know, the uh, images on TV were directed towards them because there was no uh, radio as we know it then or now or TV. So there can be a cultural aspect to this. To go one step further, I mentioned that around 30-35% of the lone actors, sometimes they are kind of so aggressive and impatient, etc., they don't do well in the extremist groups. So they will uh, essentially be uh, kicked out, but they're action motivated. I I have heard that where terrorist groups will actually uh, refuse to deal with people because they essentially, uh, they can't trust them. And they're, they're not reliable because they're not stable enough to actually take orders, and implement the orders. And they, they actually jeopardize operations rather than, rather than to help them succeed. Exactly, which is why you're not going to find individuals with major mental illnesses within terrorist cells. A good example would be, I think it was five summers ago where a couple went into a restaurant in Vegas and murdered two police officers. They had scouted out the restaurant before. They knew that uh, police would frequent there. And they came in and they uh, executed the police officers and then um, covered the bodies with one was an Aryan flag. The other one was uh, that flag that was co-opted from the uh, American Revolution, um, Don't Tread on Me. Mm, right. The snake. The snake, yeah. Yeah, and, and which the U.S. Navy actually adopted as well. But they were apparently guests at the Bundy farm and were kicked off the farm because they were so unpredictable, you you know, uh, well, whatever it was, they weren't patient enough. They wanted, they wanted, they were more action motivated. Mm -hmm. I I just, so sorry. I just want to point out that, that you mentioned Paul Gill and Emily corner for those who aren't familiar. I, Paul Gill is a, an excellent scholar. He and I actually spoke together at a conference here in Ottawa at the Canadian Police College just before COVID hit. Paul is a, is a lecturer at the University College London, and he has written some amazing work, as, as you have alluded to, alluded to, Peter, on terrorists and on lone actors. And Emily Corner, I believe, is one of his graduate students, whom, if memory serves me correct, has certainly since got her PhD. 
moving forward, how, how can we, you, I, other people in this field, what can we do to undermine or push back against this notion that it's all about mental illness when it comes to serious acts of violence? Well, it's not just in this area. I think it's the public perception of psychiatric and psychological illnesses, period. Although the the majority of my career has been working with uh, police agencies uh, in and out of uh, military intelligence agencies as well, um, occasionally doing stuff for your old outfit, I'm also on staff at uh, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, which is the largest mental health facility in Canada. And their tasks on a regular basis with trying to educate individuals that uh, try and, and, and demystify what emotional disturbance is because one in four Canadians will have some type of emotional illness at some point in their life. A diagnosable psychiatric illness which will require some form of treatment including um, medication so it's over time I hope I mean mental illness is an illness mm -hmm. I think that's one of the catchphrases of, 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 of CAM H as well and I, I'm I'm proud of my hospital and I'm proud of the the Department of Psychiatry at University of Toronto where I'm, I'm also on faculty where they're trying to uh, attack this uh, stigma, but a lot the of stigma is like I say, a yeah, huge stigma to mental illness. But a lot of it comes from TV and movies. Mm -hmm. No, you're absolutely right. I, I, if I could push back against movies and series, uh, fictional Hollywood or whatever Netflix series that talk about terrorism. And I watched them and I, I had to stop watching it because my wife said, you're a pain in the ass because you start, you keep yelling at the TV that that's not real. That's not realistic. It doesn't happen that way. So I've stopped watching them for the most part, with the exception of that excellent Swedish series, Caliphate, about a, a Swedish bunch of foreign fighters that joined ISIS. It was actually quite well done. And I, and I did a series of podcasts extolling the Swedish producers for getting it right. Because I think they talked to the Swedish security service before they made it. Peter, I, I, I sense we're going to have to come back for a part two on this because there's an awful lot that we still need to discuss. But I, I do want to thank you for taking the time to join me on the podcast and thank you for your decades worth of service. You really are Canada's, uh, I would say, foremost uh, dean when it comes to this, this, this field. You've done some incredible work with the police forces at both the municipal, the provincial and, and the federal levels over your career. And, and so thank you for your public service. And I do hope you can retire one day because I can I can tell you, my friend, retirement is really, really good because you can do whatever the hell you want, whenever the hell you want, and uh, you don't have to have to check the clock every morning. So I'm hoping that you can, in fact, find someone to fit in those very big, big shoes that you have and, and finally earn your well-deserved retirement, my friend. Well, I have two more years left uh, with the OPP. Then I'll take me to age 69, and then we'll see from... From then, uh, it's um, it's awkward because my family thinks I'm a dermatologist, <laughs> and I uh, uh, I don't know what I'm going to talk about when I when I come home. Well, I'll hire you as a consultant to my to, to my firm. How's that? Okay. Um, can I uh, ask you one question before we go? By all means, go right ahead. Uh, the Terminator movies. That means they're not real. We'll have a talk later on offline about that just to, um, yeah, we, um, I'll, I'll walk you through some details you may not be aware of. It's the only thing they show on airplanes. <laughs> anyway, take care. Thank you for the invitation. And I look forward to having other conversations with you on the podcast and as always, uh, offline as well. Thank you. That was my conversation with Peter Collins, who, as I said, is Canada's foremost I don't use the term expert because it's well overused. Canada specialist in, in many things to do with, with, with mental illness and terrorism. I'd like to know what you think. Do you have any background similar to Peter's? Do you have different experiences from what he has? You can always get in touch with me on email, borealisrisk at gmail.com or on Twitter at borealisaves. You'll also find me on LinkedIn and on Facebook. If you like this content and you want to receive more of it free of charge, go to my website, www.borealisrisk.com. Hit the subscribe button, provide your email. You'll get a free daily digest every morning, all the podcasts, the blogs, media appearances, etc., etc. 
I'd love to hear your feedback, maybe some ideas for future podcasts and blogs. I'll talk to you again soon. Until then, stay safe. Thank you.